right. And we've got it. Hey, everybody on YouTube, we're getting started here in just a moment. Court to the cloud. Got it. Got it. Got it. And okay. All right, thanks everyone for coming again to our next Water Wetlands and Watershed Seminar, the W3 Seminar. It's our semester of celebrating our 50th anniversary of the Center for Wetlands. And so again, we have another alumni with us today. It's my honor to present to you, Dr. Dave Tilly. So Dave is a professor of environmental science and technology at the University of Maryland. Um, he got his PhD and his master's here in this room, or at least in this building, in EES at UF, um, and worked at, here at the Center for Wetlands. Dr. Tilly is a researcher, innovator, and educator who tries to blend ecological engineering, a term you've heard a lot in this room, environmental entrepreneurship, which we haven't heard really much about in this room, um, and systems ecology. He's the creator of a couple of pioneering green technologies, including the Living Umbrella and the Cool Green Shelter for Bus Stops. Do we get to hear about that? Yeah, yeah. A little bit, all right. Um, and he's actually commercialized these kind of eco technologies, uh, has a company called Living Canopies LTD, Living Canopies Limited. His latest academic endeavor is to blend ecological engineering, systems ecology, and AI. So I know a lot of you are either formally using AI in your coursework or using AI to do your homework, um, something like that. <laughs> so he's trying to figure out a way that this generative AI technology can enhance nature-based solutions, um, as well as education at the undergrad and grad level. So, all right, Dave, the floor is yours. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Nice to be back at the Center for Wetlands. It's been many decades since I've been here. And uh, I feel like this is always home to me. I want to say uh, a great thanks to you guys for giving me a, an hour of your time to be here and listen to what I have to say. Hopefully this is inspirational for you. I'm going to share a little bit of my journey as I left here. I've been in academia ever since I left here in 99. And, um, and talk a little bit about AI at the end. So I'm really curious to see what you guys uh, take is on, on generative AI and specifically chat GPT. Uh, you can see I've got my little AI transparency statement there at the bottom of all my, most of the artwork that you're going to see was created in Dolly 3. So, big question, why are you here? The answer could be an infinite number of responses that would be correct. It might be just because, you know, I was passing by and I thought this might be a nice seminar to come into, or it might be that I'm working on my certificate in wetland science. Uh, or it could be a, an inordinate number of answers would be right. They're based on the past. It could also be based on the future. You know, maybe you're here to really understand about the future of wetland science. What is the next 50 years? It's incredible that this place has been here for 50 years. To me, it's a very magical place. Uh, I have a lot of great memories here working with Mark and Dr. Odom and Clay Montague was here and G. Ronnie Best, the former director back in the 90s. And it really transformed my life in so many ways, it's, it's hard to imagine what my life would be like without having been here. So hopefully you're having a similar experience here and, and ready when you leave here. It was hard to leave. I tell you, it was hard to leave Gainesville, but I did. And you got to learn a little bit about that, what I've been doing since then. So one of the things we can think about why we're here is, is H.T. Odom, of the namesake of the center. He really had the idea for you know, marrying uh, systems, uh, man and, and nature together. And one of the big inspirations he had was in Port Aransas, Texas, when he was the director of the Marine Science Institute back in the 50s. And uh, at the same time he arrived, they started, they built the wastewater treatment plant. This wastewater treatment plant started discharging to this barren sand flat. And lo and behold, what do you think emerged? But a self-designed wetland. Uh, this was inspiration for him and confirmation evidence that you actually could marry wastewater with, with nature and nature would kind of take over and create this, this natural system. So now 60 years later, this is in the top five rankings of Texas parks to visit for birding, uh, which is incredible. It's really just natural design at its best. Well, why am I here? Uh, my story, you can start the story in a lot of places, but like many places is in Raleigh when I was a student at NC State. And back then, this was pre-internet, pre-email. I was just wandering the book stacks, thinking about what am I going to do with my life? I didn't really like the degree I had chosen. I wanted to do something in nature. I also liked simulation. I was thumbing through the book stacks. And lo and behold, what did I find? With a book called Ecological Engineering, an Introduction to Ecotechnology. And there was a chapter in there, Chapter 3, Ecological Engineering and Self-Organization, H. Odom. I was like, who is this H. Odom? 
And uh, I was really uh, dug deeper, found out more about it, uh, found out more about the Odin brothers and their fame, uh, put in my form to let learn more information about the environmental engineering program here at uh, in Florida, contacted Mark, and in 1993, made my way to Gainesville to visit Mark for the first time. So that's 30 years ago, it was incredible for me. Uh, and then I arrived here in 1994, January, and one of the first classes I ever took was the wetland ecology course at that time, uh, Dr. Bess and Ramesh Reddy were operating it and Mark was a part of it as well. But I think there's really this inspiration of blending you know, the classroom exercises and the theory, but actually being out there in the field. And one of the first trips we ever took was the Oki Pinoki and Dr. Bess loved to get you to stand on a floating island. Of course, you, you're clueless of what's going on. He's sitting there lecturing, and slowly but surely, the water is creeping up your legs until finally he's finished with his his, uh, his lecture that's up to the halfway up to your thigh because the island is sinking, and you really start to learn about the dynamics of wetlands. And of course, we learned all these other great things. Emergy is a big take-home message for me. It's something I've been working with for years, and I really love the diagramming and the simulation. And Mark and I have been rekindling our, our thoughts about information theory lately, so... And then in uh, 1999, I graduated, had to leave, uh, got my first academic job, luckily, at the Texas A&M University in Kingsville in South Texas, and continued my research on wetlands. Uh, so I did some work uh, in a uh, shrimp aquaculture wetland. But the first thing I found out about Texas, though, was everything's bigger in Texas, <laughs> including the ditches. This is a <laughs> ditch, literally a, ditch, a dog in a ditch. But this is the source water for a shrimp aquaculture uh, facility they use to construct a wetland to treat the wastewater and produce it. And what we did some you know water quality analysis, found out it worked really well for treating water. But one of the things we like to do was uh, was hyperspectral radiometry, which I kind of picked up from from H. T. Odom and, and Mark when I was here, looking at the spectral of uh, plants and seeing if you could read the response. And what we're able to do is detect for salinity stress plants. You could take the radiometer, look at the plant leaf, and understand whether or not it was under stress from the salinity because this was a an oligo haline marsh uh, there on the Gulf Coast. So uh, a little bit of salt in, in the water. And uh, then I kind of took that idea and ran with it when I got to Maryland. Maryland, I moved there in 2001 and joined the Biological Resources Engineering Department. They had an ecological engineering program that was pretty well renowned. Continued my wetland radiometry work. We actually built a boat and put a boom on it. It's a 75 foot boom and put our hyperspectral radiometer on the end of that so we could hoisted over the marsh. This is what it looked like out there in the field on some tidal freshwater marshes on the, on the Nanticoke River over on the eastern shore of Maryland. And there I am proudly captaining my ship there on the left-hand side. Uh, and we did some, you know, some, a lot of fun in the field, tromp around in the wetlands. Um, students there, grad students joining me. And uh, we were able to produce some knowledge from that. So we just got into really some deep multivariate statistical analysis that was new to me called partial least squares. You know, the kind of take home message here is we could detect um, nutrient enrichment in the soil through the plants, through the liquids so of the plants. You can see that here with the, these different graphs. So I continue that work with the wetlands, but then lo and behold, in 2006, uh, my engineering department imploded. Uh, basically, there was a big move at the higher levels of campus uh, to move our department from the College of Agriculture to the College of Engineering, which may not sound like a big deal, uh, but to us, what we realized was they were going to turn it into a biomedical engineering department, and the environmental piece was going to be very much left behind. So some of us stayed behind and, and formed our own environmental science and technology department. So about that same time, I basically, there was a lot of questions floating in my head. Am I going to have a job? They're destroying my department. We had to reconfigure the whole department. At the same time, I was getting ready to go for tenure the next year. So I was like, oh, my God, am I going to get yeah. tenure to put in five years here, seven years out of school? Uh, but luckily, everything worked out in the end and made it through. Recovered from that and went from wetlands to working on living architecture with green roofs and green walls. This is an emerging industry, and in, in, especially in Maryland. So I jumped on board and started working with the landscape architects, understand the energetics of uh, these green walls. Uh, there's an industry, Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, that's based in Canada. Collaborated a lot with them. Uh, basically, do studies by looking at the energetics of green walls. This is a little example of a wall covered with great vegetation, measuring the the heat balance of that, the energy balance of these these walls, these green walls. And we can see here is it basically you know, it reduces the temperature uh, getting through the temperature of the indoor air, the heat getting through the building because you have all that, you know, that energy balance is greatly affected by the vegetation. Uh, then in 2010, moved on, I started working with architects more. Like, well, the architects really do some neat, cool stuff. And like they work with people. And before that, I was like, I hardly ever worked with people. And I was like, well, wow, 
It's a whole different perspective when you get to work with people intimately on a project. So we joined the Solar Decathlon project, which is supported by the Department of Energy. We built this house. We called it Watershed because it used all these living system, systems elements like wetlands and green roofs and green walls and rain gardens and solar panels. Uh, and then uh, we won the competition that year out of 20 schools. The first time we had been in it many years, but we never won it. And we finally won it. And uh, the power company was so impressed. They bought it and turned it into their sustainability center. So that's what you see here, the Pepco Watershed Sustainability Center. Uh, and the great thing about this is the head is bathroom wetland, right? <laughs> and the architecture just loved this idea. If you look over here on the on the uh, is this the pointer? There we yeah. go. Uh, on the left hand side, this is the shower. So you stand here, shower, and then this is the wetland. The wetland starts here. This is the shower over here, and there's this treatment wetland. So as you shower, you can watch your water be cleaned by the wetland. So they loved having that really tight feedback with nature, and I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, but this is definitely the smallest constructed wetland ever designed. Uh, fast forward to 2015, I had this idea to put plants on umbrellas. Uh, campus said, you know what, we can turn that into a business if you had joined the NSFI Corps. And I was like, you know what, I've been employed in my career, I'll just give it a go. So me and my graduate student, Nick, here uh, basically took it on and we developed the product, we developed the patent around it, uh, developed a business around it called Living Canopies. We sold them. We ultimately had them in some Sam's Clubs a few years ago on a trial basis. Uh, but while being in Sam's Club, where I started to really kind of question, what else could we do this? Could we do more for people? Kind of coming back to the idea of helping people out. And then that's why we came up with the idea for the Cool Green Shelter for bus stops. If you look around the country in the United States, uh, there's 500,000 bus stops, but there's only 100,000 shelters. There's a real inequity issue with bus shelters. And the ones we have are typically pretty horrendous. They're not really doing anything for the environment. They're not really environmentally designed. So we decided, you know what, let's put green roofs on them. Let's put our living canopies on them. Let's put solar panels on, panels on them. Let's manage the stormwater. Let's reuse the stormwater. Let's provide people solar power. It's an off-grid operation. And uh, so we've just started this uh, the last couple of years. We got a couple of contracts with some small towns in Maryland. So we're trying to continue our, our efforts with living canopies. Um, I highly encourage you to think about innovation and entrepreneurship. I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to make the uh, impact for the environment in a positive way through that means. And the final th thing I'd say about entrepreneurship is basically trying to figure out new revenue models. So this is where my systems ecology training came in. The idea is to have, uh, oops, uh, to have uh, corporate sponsors, we call them ESG, environment, social, and government sponsors, that really offer an opportunity to to uh, to build and maintain these these shelters for underserved communities. So we're working on that. We've got some buy-in from some corporations like grocery stores and, and the power company. We're trying to expand that operation as well. So we're pretty excited about that. All right, but you know, what about systems ecology? I love this AIR. You can imagine anything and put it in. I'm like, you know, I really wear two hats. I've done that for a long time, the ecological engineering side and the, the energy or system side. Uh, so this brings us to, to the AI. Uh, probably like a lot of you earlier this year, I was like, what's this chat GPT stuff? It sounds kind of cool. People started talking about it, started playing with it a lot. I was so drawn to it and this power. And I was like, you know what? I really want to learn more about this. The best way to learn is to create a course and teach about it. So I created a course for this fall called ENST 499E, AI for the Environment, where I really just been taking a deep dive. I call it a safari or exploration. We're just learning what's available. And chat GPT and open AI are always introducing new tools. So it's been very adaptive. So I'd say we take a pioneer's mindset to this course. Uh, so just a little bit about, you know, that you have not familiar with the models. They are models. They're not like the internet. The internet is searching for pages that exist. They're more like a Wikipedia. You know, Google's going and finding that page for you, presenting it to you. In the language models, they've, they've modeled the entire knowledge of humanity that it's been able to scan and turn this into a mathematical model. So the first thing you have to do is you have to turn words into numbers. Uh, so words are concepts. If I say the word light, it's a concept. It could have a lot of different kinds of concepts. Maybe it's about weight. Maybe it's about you know, solar light. Maybe it's about electrical light. Uh, so really words, when you turn them into numbers, then you start mapping them out and their relationships, you can basically start to build these kind of clouds of word associations. And the, uh, the linguists call this word embeddings, the computer science that work on this. So the idea is to create this word embeddings, and then you start to use that and you basically combine that. Here's another, um, a larger cloud you can think of. Uh, one of the good ways to think about it is really a sentence is a path through the clouds, or it's literally a vector 
right? Um, so when you're saying a sentence, you're really just saying a number of vectors relative to some other vector that's, that's existed before. It's a whole different way to really think about what language is. Um, and really the great thing about AI is you know, it uses these neural networks to do that, to map out and get the weightings and train them and all this data. And that produces this model that's actually fairly efficient at being used you know, computationally and very powerful um, to produce a lot of information, not only text, but also patterns and imagery, uh, and then also to create coding, right? Program programmable codes uh, using Python and other kinds of programming languages. So what I thought, I was gonna pull up ChatGBT, but it wasn't working earlier, so I'm not even gonna try. So I've had a little backup plan to just give some examples of the things I've used it for. Uh, first thing is like, you just think about student, okay, I'm a horrible writer, I misspell a lot. So this first one is, is a, a prompt that you put in, you've got all this misspelling, all those words in red that are misspelled. And I just say, the prompt is, please correct this paragraph. And chat responds with all the words corrected. The structure of the sentence is pretty much kept intact. Right, this is a story about my dog getting muddy in a mud puddle. His dog's name is, is Jerish. Uh, and I have a swimming pool. Presumably, I've washed him in this, this swimming pool. So uh, you can start there, but then you'd be like, well, you know what? Actually, improve my writing. So we start to learn is prompt engineering is very important. So how you actually phrase the question or the prompt can really dictate how it responds and gives you back different information. So you put in... This prompt, not only correct it, but make it sound smarter. So what's smarter? <laughs> you can see it. Yesterday, my canine companion, Jerish, traversed through a puddle of mud, consequently becoming a grind with a murky substance. <laughs> it's incredible the language that it has. Then it kind of goes on. You wrote a lot more. Interesting incident. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, well, you know, then it's like, well, let's think it's really interesting. Can I get it to do even more? How about I... Um, I acted, get it to write a 200 word short story in the style of Harry Potter. Right, so you can basically tell it to be anybody to pretend it to be any kind of writer that knows, you know, knows Maya Angelou and knows, you know, uh, Mark Twain or whatever. So on this one, it's really great. It's, Upon the eve of a mislaid yesterday, within the confines of our enchanted dwelling, my valiant canine, Jerish, inadvertently scampered through a concealed puddle of mud becoming enveloped in this dark, treacherous, treacherous embrace. I mean, it's like incredible. It can take this. And it has all this nuances that it really understands. Like The thing is, like, you talk to the experts, and they're like, we have no idea how it knows how to do this, right? They're just like, they built this model, and it's like, well, it works, but we don't really know how. Um, so those are probably things that maybe you knew about a little bit. But then, you know, it actually has this function. Now, I wish I could demonstrate it, but... Um, in chat GPT-4, which is one you pay for, 20 bucks a month, which is one we use for class, it has all these tools that you can use that aren't available in the regular chat 3.5. And one of them is called advanced data analysis. So advanced data analysis tools. And uh, basically you can take a file, so I could take this file as a text file, as a CSV file, an Excel file, or whatever, load it up into my prompt, and then basically said, you know, please determine whether fertilizer A is better than fertilizer B in growing my plants. You want to see if the server is free? You want to give it a shot? shot? Yeah, yeah, let's see. If you navigate it. Fingers crossed. <clears throat> you pay, right? You should get a... I, or I should get a, <clears throat> a super highway here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's go. So let's just move this stuff a little bit out of the way. And then we can just full screen as well. All right. So we are in chat four. And in chat four, there's a default function. And then there's also the browse with theme. And we're going to use the advanced data analysis tool. So I'm going to turn that on. It's in beta version. What's this little plus here? And then I need to go. I'm going to drop a file in. Can I just? Yeah. Where did my, my data file Let's see? Can I do this? Sorry, I'm a little rusty on PC. So this is my fertilizer data these, that we saw earlier. I can just say, uh, can you perform statistical misspell? <laughs> it will know. I don't know. Yeah. 
I'm going to turn on the T test so we can get a better punch in it. <clears throat> All right, what's going to happen? Let's see. Certainly, before we proceed with this, I need to look at your data and understand the structure. So what it's doing here is it's actually opening up and writing Python code to analyze the data. So it can call it functions in Python. And see how it works. <laughs> Where was this when I was in grade? <laughs> It says the proceeding with the t-test, we need to understand your hypothesis, what you're trying to compare. So it's actually telling me some some facts about t-test and what when I can use it, when I can't use it. Uh, see, once you provide this information, is your data paired? Uh, no, it's not paired. It's funny because every time I do this, it's a little, it's a little different. Uh -huh. Are you looking for compare the means? Yes. So do you have any specific? Is a show me what kind of sample test is going to be there. <laughs> we'll need the statistics anymore. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, obviously, this is the most simple kind of test you do. This says it rejects another hypothesis. There's no difference between the means of the two groups. Um, so where's the results in here? I was actually telling about the null and the alternative are. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. You're going to like, give me a distribution. I didn't even ask for that. <laughs> it's doing all these other tests to see if there's like normality, which you got to do for your t test sometimes. Yeah, yeah sure. To get more sophisticated. I think that that test, like I've heard of Shapiro will, I've heard, I've never heard of Levine's test. I don't know these. So first it was making sure that your distributions met the assumptions of the T-test. Right? right. Is which it better is, than the, the yeah. having this normality? Right. Thing. They're saying, yeah, okay. And now it's doing some more here. And equal variances. And I gave him my p-value here. So I got a very low p value. So there should be they should be different. Should say they're oh, because the way you phrased it was is a better than b, yeah. and so it gave you a negative uh, t statistic. So yeah, and then it's, it's much lower than 0.05. Uh -huh. and that said we reject the null hypothesis because they are different. So yeah, so fertilizer. The mean, the mean one is like fifty five, and the mean the other is like eighty three. Uh -huh. You could kind of see it if we scroll back to that. <laughs> Right there. So uh, that's like pretty incredible, right? Go back to the PowerPoint, or uh, keep, uh, keep, keep doing yeah, yeah. How are we doing on time? We're right? you good? You have uh, about kind of twenty journey, about yeah. twenty three minutes. All right. So um, then you think, okay, well, it can do data analysis. Can it actually um, do other kinds of analysis? And uh, one of the things we learned here is the simulation, the numerical simulation model, right? Taking differential equations. And uh, in modeling it, uh, but one of the first steps you want to do to get to that is um, we need to go back to um, start a new test here. And um, I created a little systems diagram here and drew this by hand. Actually, I'm sorry, I got to change. Sorry, I'm to I got switched back to default. So in default, they had this image detection. So now I'm going to go drop in my systems diagram. It's a little tank model you, you saw up there. This guy here, right? So there's an input, source, storage, there's outflow. Of course, I'm going to navigate and get continued. So I'll get back. I'll get back to uh, go back to that little uh, the Chrome. And we're in Chrome 101. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So I dropped that in. I was like, okay. Um, Describe what you see in this image. But you know what you have to do? You have to be polite to chat. It works much better if you're polite. If you're polite. <laughs> There's actually somebody did a study. If you're more polite, you usually get better responses. Again, why? Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. 
got something here. Um, there's a left. This is what I tell my my drawing. They said look, my source looks like an apple. Uh -huh. <laughs> but it's labeled J. Yeah, I picked that up. I could read that that text. And then in the middle, there's a shape looks like a pentagon or a house with a Q inside. That's my storage. On the right, there's the arrow pointing out. It's got to recognize the outflow is a zero Q. This is some kind of mathematical or functional relation between you. It's not clear what exact context of this field diagram. Yeah, but it's like well, I can then say, well, I can kind of give it a clue. Like, yeah, this is. <laughs> Go on there. Well, wow, that's really another you know, input output model. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say good job. Yes. yes. Can you Let's see what happens. You should come back and tell me to actually spell out the differential equation. We find those like there's all these different tools, and all the different tools aren't linked. So sometimes you go do one in certain tool, like the image detection. Then I would take that to the data analysis tool from what I learned from here if I want to actually simulate this differential equation. A little slower than usual. Um, I think this is peak time of day, too, middle of the day. There it is. Gross. <laughs> it should give us a nice little equation box. There we are. EQ DT equals JI minus JO. It's going to substitute for JO. KLQ got a differential equation. Mm -hmm. And then basically, I could, you, know, you, you mm -hmm. can imagine like taking a more complex model, right, and doing that, and then getting all the equations from it. And then you can take that to the data analysis tool and say, like, try to be the program to simulate this, this model. And it would do it. Um, all right. So I'm going to go back to. Yeah. So we did the fertilizer. Uh, I forgot about finding scholarly papers. People are like, well, can I find scholarly papers? Browse with Bing is pretty good. It's a little rough around the edges. Sometimes it finds stuff, sometimes it doesn't. It definitely cites things it finds. Uh, Scholar AI. So the other thing it has are these plugins. So plugins are kind of like apps on your phone, right? You got these apps on your smartphone. On an AI, you've got these plugins. It's all these other third party software that are building ways to interface with chat GPT. So there's something like a thousand plugins uh, currently. Uh, we've tested out a few in my class, maybe like 10 of them. You know, five out of 10 are kind of trash. They don't really do seem to do anything, but five of them are like really impressive. This one, Scholar AI is really good. It'll only search open source uh, databases for peer reviewed literature, but when it finds it, it'll give you the title, the authors, it'll summarize the abstract, and it'll give you a link to the PDF or to the HTML. Um, <laughs> So you get that? So uh, it looks yeah. like it's <laughs> you can I really don't read your research site. proposal with you know not enough citations at this point. You know, uh, no this is also this very powerful software Wolf from Alpha that has like the Mathematica software, so it links to that. So that's like super powerful yeah. database with that. And this is the one we just did. We did a numerical simulation. Actually, we didn't do this, but this is I'll show you this one. So this is what I would continue. This one, what I did was. Not the tank model we just looked at, but you know the classic prey predator model, the Locke and Volterra model from the 1930s or something like that. It's classic. Uh, I just basically in Texas, can you create this simulation, this numerical simulation for a prey predator? Show me the equations. Uh, pretend that it's mice and cats, right? So it outputs all this. Here's the differential equations for it. It's got your alpha and beta and everything. Makes assumptions for all my uh, my rate coefficients. Uh, and then, you know, again, it's writing Python code to do this, and it gives me output to come up with a graph there. Well, there's my, my mice are in blue and my cats are in red, so it, it looks like it should look. Uh, and then it probably you know, it's explained to me what's going on there with oscillatory behavior and stuff like that. So, you know, incredible um, power there. There's the Python code. That it's, that I've never written Python code. I don't know anything about Python code, but uh, in this case, you don't really need to. All right. Um, we did the image, we just did that one. So uh, I get get back to wetlands a little bit. Uh, it's like, can it detect ecosystems? Can it know what one ecosystem is from another? So I put in an image of this, this wetland. This is a similar wetland I showed you earlier with the radiometer on the boat. This is a title, Freshwater Martian. There's a little bit of swamp in the background. And uh, you know, basically just says, please describe what's in this photograph. 
And it says, well, this is a natural wetland scene. There's a emergent vegetation. It's got lily pads. And it writes, you know, a whole paragraph of describing this photo, uh, this very accurate, uh, which is very impressive. And chat GPT-4, uh, you need to do this? Four, four, you can do this. And not only can you do it on the computer, but now you can do it on your phone. So you take a picture of something, you say, describe what's in this photo. I can go out and take a picture of a leaf, a tree, you know, anything, and it will describe it. Um, and I thought this was an opportunity to think about, you know, from a research standpoint, that was a picture from the fall, and it recognized it being the fall if we'd read on. It, it knew if that one was from the fall. This one's from the winter when the, the marsh is dormant, and it knew that, right? It, it, now, as you see how much it's explained about this graph. Looked at the water coverage, the vegetation, the plants have died back. It's a different season. It thinks it's winter. So we can start to imagine, it's like, with wetland health, I could just take photos of wetlands. I could, like, incorporate community science, take all these photos that people are creating, and have chat GPT analyze them and tell me maybe what's going on with the health of wetlands. You know, just as an idea. Um, let me just interrupt for a real quick second. I was just in Maine and they have on the national or the state parks out there, they have these positions where you take photographs, I think eight total from this position, and you send them to a, uh, to the park and they're analyzing change. Yeah. And, there you go. They'll yeah. do it for you. And so people are doing that from their five phones. They submit the, the, the pictures. Uh -huh. And then I would I imagine right now, if somebody is looking at <laughs> yeah. it, it wouldn't take very much to do this. Yeah. I mean, incredible. yeah, crazy to do it for me. This is stuff they just introduced like in the last month as well. So we've been playing around the class. Um, I had a picture of like a bicycle for sale in my front yard. I'll get new the bicycle, the color it's for sale. And it was like in a front yard and all this stuff. Yeah, I can really just recognize all kinds of nuances. We tested different kinds of ecosystems. We did coral reefs, we did forests, we did like streetscapes and stuff like that. And it always knows it's in the, in the photo. You can read words that are in the photos. Um, so this kind of brings me to like the bigger piece of um, the talk, the kind of more theoretical, heady stuff of the future is like, well, and we were really like being inundated. This is a really, really powerful stuff. You know, they've taken this knowledge that has taken us millennia to create, you know, the humans have created, and it's understood it and it's put into this little file that basically is like almost fits on your computer, it's like this little two gigabyte file. Incredible amount of, you know, high quality information, compact, and now we have it at our fingertips. So it's really just going to drive how we work and how we interact with data. Anything that becomes a pattern, anything you can digitize, whether well, it's visual, auditory, you know, you can make fake voices, you can model voices, reproduce music with different artists, all these kind of things. So anything you basically do in front of a computer, AI is going to be able to make it that much faster, probably that much better. So we're really under this evolutionary bump here where we're going to have to adapt pretty quickly. Um, so I thought it'd be kind of interesting to think about, you know, how how we've how information flow has changed over the, the evolution of humanity. And if you go back, we didn't really have writing uh, before like 750 BC, something like that. So we just had oral storytellers. But you could actually calculate. The information being processed and the speed at which it's being processed, how much we're generating, how much we're telling the stories, how much is being absorbed by the people. Um, and it's pretty slow, right? There's no technology available. It's just being there and listening to people. And uh, even like Socrates supposedly hated writing because he said you're going to dumb down society because you're not going to have to remember yeah. the story. So uh, he thought writing was a bad thing. <clears throat> but um, you know, being a systems uh, scientist, I thought we'll start diagramming this so we can kind of understand it. Well, if you just think about, we got R as the environment producing the real world systems, you know, in this, this abstract idea. And then we got human intelligence. So we're basically, humans are sensing the world and studying in all these different ways, as scientists, as people, and it's developing our intelligence in this grand scheme of things. So it's a pretty simple little model. And it's all based on this, this uh, um, it's not, it's not, um, accelerated by any real super technology or anything like that, or any technology. Uh, but then writing came along in 750 BC. So now we got people scribes who are copying stuff and people can read stuff and you can preserve information better. You can distribute it more widely. It's gonna last longer, right? Not just counting on somebody to remember a story. Uh, so now you've jumped up in scale uh, and uh, then the printing press comes along in the 1400s and man, books, the number of books that were printed in the first 50 years after the Gutenberg printing press or something like in the millions, you know, in Europe, there's an incredible amount of, you know, information being processed and stored and distributed. Um, and then, of course, jumping 
head to our modern times, now we got the internet, social media, or smartphones. You know, there's seven billion uh, web, there's seven billion smartphones, two billion websites, three billion people on Facebook. This is a huge amount of you know, inundation of how we're just connected with this information. It's very powerful for us. So in our model, we call that shared knowledge, and this is kind of building on some of the stuff that Dr. Odin did uh, way back. Uh, and uh, I don't know how much you guys have learned about energy and stuff like that, but the flow of energy is, is the power, and basically this idea of the quality of energy is something you're tracking with empower. This idea of maximizing empower um, is something that we do as humans that we can't really resist. We can't fight against it because it's such a large driving force of the universe. Um, but what that does is it makes the shared knowledge, right? So this is all the books and all the digital pages and uh, websites and whatever pictures on the internet. So like, yeah, so that's our shared knowledge. We would call that high transformity. It's really powerful for the amount of energy that's still there. It can have a large influence on us, right? So that's uh, that's the internet today and Wikipedia and all that stuff. Um, and then we come to AI and we just got this explosion of users. Within the first like week or two of the, the release of ChatGPT, there are like 100 million users. Uh, it's incredible. It's, I don't know how many there are today, but maybe it's like double that, that number. Um, so people are really adapting to this. And uh, what you know, what generative AI is doing is a whole other level of intelligence. It's built off the shared knowledge. So you got humans working down here, right? And they got these extra production functions, not only creating the shared knowledge, but also we create the artificial intelligence. That feeds back, that feeds into human intelligence somewhat, feeds into shared knowledge. So it's this whole other larger, more powerful loop that we're getting ready to be immersed in. Uh, and I would say humans plus Generative AI is really what's going to be maximizing power. So this idea of you know, use it or lose it, it's like if you don't get on board with generative AI, you're going to be kind of left behind because it's going to be so powerful, make make you so much more productive in so many different ways. Uh, it's going to be a strong urge to to be able to use that. So I started to do some calculations. I kind of ran out of time actually getting some some data together. So this is more of a theoretical idea of, of how it changed through that. The, the span of human uh, information processing back to our oral history there on the left. And you think about the human information flow is just us having a conversation or hearing that story, right? That's a pretty low amount of information. So that's really low on the graph. And then as you move to the right, with writing and the printing press, every time the amount of information that we're having flowing and absorbing and using, having access to is going up. Uh, and it keeps getting larger and larger. And the blue represents really what kind of humans are doing without technology, right? So that might be you and I just having a conversation over dinner or, or driving the car or whatever, unassisted by technology. But most of our communication is assisted by technology today, email, uh, texting, all that kind of stuff. Well, generative AI is only gonna make that bigger. But so I think there's a, there's a relationship between how much technology is driving the communication and how much we are driving it as humans. There's a ratio there that's going down, right? The technology is just overwhelming us. I was thinking like some analogies. It's like you're right in this room, probably weighs somewhere between 100 and 200 pounds. Uh, if somebody laid 100 pounds on you, you'd probably be okay. It might be uncomfortable, but it wouldn't kill you. But if somebody laid 1,000 pounds on you, you'd be like, you'd probably be crushed or be extremely uncomfortable. If somebody put 10,000 pounds on you, you're over, right? So the analogy is that weight is like the AI. It's just it's so powerful to be able to do all these these crazy things. Um, we really have to adapt to it and adapt quickly. So um, we're getting near the end here. Uh, so the big question is, you know, like why are we here as humans? Are we just here for a certain period of time on Earth to have created this artificial intelligence and then we're no longer going to be needed because it's so smart with some of the kind of doomsday or talk you get from, from people in the field, in the AI field? Yeah, you know, maybe it's, that's a little extreme, but it really thinks it makes you question about, you know, why are we? humans here, you know, what is the purpose? Is there a purpose and all that kind of good stuff? Uh, I don't have any answers, but it's just a thought provoking question. Uh, but I have this analogy that uh, there's a, one of our colleagues from Sweden, he was a part of the Center for Wellness, he used to visit us, uh, Torbjorn Reedberg. Uh, he once showed me this diagram uh, similar to this, where on the left-hand side, you've got in the old days, the horse is working for the humans, right? Uh, but then we invented automobiles, and now you know, who's doing? Who's serving who? We're pulling around the horses. The horses are no longer doing the work. Uh, the horses are just kind of this luxury. You know, there's only like six million horses in the United States today. 
way less than it would have been back in the you know hundred years ago. Um, but we still keep them around, right? We like them. They're lovable. They're kind of cuddly, little beastly, <laughs> beautiful animals. Uh, so you know, is the the future is like who's serving who? Where's AI? And where are we? Are we just serving AI? Is AI going to keep us around? Um, so we're just being towed around in this truck by AI and my uh, um, vision of the future. Uh, you know, when does this occur? I don't know if ever. Obviously, it's not you know a big theoretical question. So uh, with that, I think just a couple of principles. Uh, you guys are all young, getting ready to graduate and do wonderful things. And you always ask what's possible. Uh, I think going out there and interacting with people. Don't forget about the people. As sometimes as engineers and scientists, we forget about that. They're very important. I learned a lot from all the different kind of collaborations I've had over the years. Uh, take risks. Uh, I think one of the things I'm kind of proud of is I have taken a lot of risks. Uh, sometimes it's panned out, sometimes it hadn't. Uh, but you really got to do that. You got to kind of be uh, fearsome sometimes. Uh, and then finally, embrace generative AI. Get on the, the bandwagon uh, or you might be left behind. So with that, thank you very much for the invite and the opportunity to, to share a little bit of my thinking with you. Thanks, Thanks. All right, thanks, Dave, <clears throat> for the great talk. So let's open it up. I know you have questions for Dr. Tilly, so let's go to the room first. The room. Yeah. Who's using AI in here? Yeah, what are you using it for? Sure. Whenever I write anything, I usually like to make the sound better, and I kind of like get engaged and like, okay, what, how can I improve my writing? So like, I try and take some of the things that you've heard and you said. Uh -huh. oh, do you try to give some kind of style that you want it to follow, or does it kind of like learn your style or anything like that? Yeah, just want to make it sound better. Uh -huh. And using which, which AI are you? Yeah. 3.5 or mm -hmm. 3.5? Yeah, even that's really, really powerful. Who else is using AI? So some other hands pump up. Similar emails. Yeah. Crafting is like to what kind of email would be a good example? Everybody, um, every email you create, not every email you create. No, like, not everything, like, but um, like I had a job offer earlier and I was trying to ask him for different questions and so to make it sound as educational as possible. Yeah, I think I do the same thing I do. I had to write a letter of recommendation. Oh man, it's, 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 I get the basic framework of the person and what I know about them. I was like, you know, make this sound a certain way. And, or sometimes the king's back comes back and it's too verbose, too many like big words. I'm like, yeah. like my very an esteemed colleague. Well, I've used it for the same thing. And it's like I have, you know, I can write a letter. I know the person well, but like sometimes you, you know, you've done it so many times. It's like you need yeah. a kickstart. Yeah. And then you can make it your yeah. own. Yeah. So, yeah. What about Nate? Yeah, I think it's awesome when you're like introducing how to use ChatGPT and all the different functionalities of it. I do wonder sometimes though, like I can see you're writing Python and code and can you do statistical analysis. What the balance is between teaching someone to say, hey, write how to plot these functions versus you know how to actually program certain things and like learning statistics. Yeah. That balance is like I, mean, I know. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of slippery slopes to navigate on, on this one. I think in, my, in the course I teach, I you know I'm encouraging people to explore and use it a lot. But my one rule in that class is we'll just be transparent when you've used it. You know, so if you've written it, you know, just make a statement that says I used it to help me in whatever way it helped. Because uh, I think it's just going to become unavoidable in the future. I mean, it's like how are you not going to be? You're going to be so tempted, and like you're in all these situations where it makes so much more sense. It makes you much, so much more productive and efficient every time. So. Yeah, it's like what do we even need to learn as humans? What should we actually teach? This point? The thing I learned in my class is like the the power to make productive use of it. I think is a function of the student's knowledge, though. So there's some relationship between you. Know, if you're like if you're a fifth grader, right, you'd have a hard time doing certain things with it on that extreme case. So there's even in the in the, in the gradation of a college student, you know, some like a freshman, maybe they're not quite as prepared and they don't know as much, so they can't really use it as powerfully. Whereas you, when you're more uh, kind of knowledgeable about a science field or something like that, you can really like accelerate and really amplify. So I think it was more like an amplifier almost rather than like you know copilot. Some good about a copilot. Well, copilot could kind of take over and do the same thing you could do. But an amplifier is proportional to how much you can put into it. How often do you find it making mistakes? You know, chat GPT four, it's not very often. I mean, three point five used to find it, it would do that kind of stuff. But four, man, it's just like it's hard for it for me to ever find the mistake that it makes. Occasionally, you know, it'll it'll misinterpret 
when you give it a real big challenge, we actually try to make it like checkers with us. So we create, have it create check, the game checkers, you know, we just move stuff around. And it, uh, it'll get confused about where the pieces were, stuff like that, and which way to move them and who was there where. But if you kept working with it, eventually you kind of learned the right way to do it. You just had to be kind of patient and back and forth with it. I think that's the other thing. It's, it's like having a conversation with a very wise person. You know, uh, you got to be patient and you got to be able to translate and communicate with them uh, to get that really high end product out of it. That's what I found. So you said kind of like use it or lose it, get left behind. Like, is there an argument for opting out or is it just, <laughs> is it just like the Luddites all over again? Uh, I think, you know, or is there, is there a facet of life or a component to like to leave it be? I think I, I've heard those arguments. Definitely when you survey students, it's like a third of them are like, yeah, let's do this. This is great. And then a third of them are like, I don't want anything to do with this. It's unethical. There's like kind of copyright issues. Uh, I don't believe that it. And they want to you know, leave it alone. And then there's a group in the middle. They're kind of like, yeah, what they're telling me to do all these things. Yes. But the thing that struck me is they're like, students are like seeing so humdrum about it. Of course, I'm just like, my God, this thing is like incredible. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah, like when you got your first Atari or whatever. I mean, you're pretty excited, but you know, it was sort of like just or Nintendo. I don't know what yeah, old yeah. you are, but uh, yeah, it's just the technology of the day. Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a question for you, and it's, it's got two parts. One is where is energy going, and the second part is with all the complexities that are embedded in an energy analysis. You know, I haven't even tried, and to, the, to this day, I haven't tried an energy analysis on it, but that would be like, that'd be a great thing to try and see if you could emulate and improve the energy analysis and maybe get it for you. Different pathways that society should take in, in making decisions. Yeah. Well, the next thing is they just introduced a new version of it, upgraded version of four, they call it four plus. You can, in, in, it, you can get it to read an entire book. Before you're kind of limited how much, how many pages it would read, but now you can upload a whole book. So Mark and I were talking, it'd be nice to like just upload Environment Power and Society. It's like, here, you're, you're H.T. Odom. And then we'll start asking you questions <laughs> at H.T. Odom and see what it comes back with. So I think there's a lot of opportunity. That's really how I use it as almost my intellectual mentor. And mm -hmm. a lot of ways, it's like, well, pretend to be, you know, some famous physicist, pretend to be H.T. Odom, and then set up the conversation. And, uh, it knows it. And it was, you know, it's work and stuff. So just a note for the students, you know, like when you write your one page or one or two paragraph write-ups for this class, it is very clear to me sometimes when people use something like ChatGPT, right? Yeah. One, actually, there's a pretty good correspondence between ChatGPT generated uh, simple prompts and the Turnitin score. Like it actually is uh, fairly well correlated. Uh, and then the other thing is like, you know, being somewhere and sort of hearing what what Dr. Tilly said and then translating it to your assignment. This is not to like threaten you, but like in all of your classes, if the teacher, if the instructor has like a little presence of mind, it's pretty easy to differentiate. And we did it in class, right? We, oh, and you're not in class. We did yeah, it in class and we did chat GPT generated versus original yeah. content about yeah. photosynthesis. And the Turnitin scores were, chat GPT would have found a significant difference uh -huh. between the two scores. There's much higher turn it in scores of, of plagiarism with the yeah. chat GPT generated stuff. But I bet they could learn how to get around it. input an essay and it can tell you like where exactly like chat GPT is so that you can kind of like tweak it. Tweak it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah. See what I what I want to do, and I was at a meeting with some other faculty on campus the other day, and um, as I show, I just want to make it my teaching assistant, my grader for my class. So they get all these write, reading, you know, writing assignments. Like I can't read, I can't keep up with the assignments. Yeah. And I get behind, and it can do that. It can basically, you could give it a rubric and say you can score all these kinds of. Have it make points. a rubric. If you can have it make the rubric, yeah. and then yeah. say that's a good rubric. Yeah. And I use the rubric. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah. You know, that's back to your question. It's like there's just all these gray areas about what you can do with it and, you know, what's, what should we be doing? What should we be honest about? Um, I mean, the challenge, of course, is that if no one knows what, like, you know, the actual mechanics behind a t-test are at some point, and then, you yeah. know, have we done, like, further removed sort of science literacy and sort of in the discourse of making decisions, you know? Yeah. But right. I don't know, with the bars already kind of low. I would submit that you couldn't use it if you didn't understand what a T test was, because it was asking you more, yeah. in, more input questions. Was it a fair test? Uh, yeah. You know, and so forth and so on. 
without that knowledge, you can't uh, use it. So yeah, I think that's like back to what I was calling like the amplifier effect. If you don't have a certain level of knowledge, then it's, exactly. you can't use the, the advantage there. But uh, but then you could say, well, explain to me, you know, give me a lesson on cheese right. testing. You know, so a lot of what we were talking about is has been any number of times that we're going in a theoretical place, and I would love to have HTO to will throw this thoughts back and forth with him, okay? And because that was where we really sometimes made new science was chatting back and forth. So we thought, well, what if we put all of Odom's books in the chat PT? Yeah. And then <laughs> I did that, you know, when I get a response back, it was more than, than regurgitated, just what I put in. Yeah, it's getting, they got like fine tuning, like you actually take their model and then like get to focus on a certain amount of knowledge. Um, so that's all going to be coming soon. Yeah. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause to Dr. Hayes. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone on YouTube. We will see you next week when our speaker will be. We have coming to us live in the room, Dr. Mark Clark here from UF, another alumni. So we'll see you next week, and he'll be talking about SEEP, the storm.